think, uh, I remember right, last week we got through the end of chapter 1, is that right? I, th I think that's what I had in my notes. I, I, I had it that we were supposed to start on Malachi chapter 2, but if I missed the last verse of Malachi and you really want to talk about it, uh, we can. I think everybody decided, okay, let's go to Malachi chapter 2. Let's begin by reading that. And uh, I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we'll go back and start picking it apart a verse or two at a time. Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> and now, o priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke. I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So, so shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts, and so I make you despise and abase before all people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any, descendants, any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord has witnessed between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So, God, so guard yourselves in your spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her says to the Lord, the God of Israel, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garments with violence says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. So last, the, the first chapter, we kind of talked about how that was to uh, Israel in general and sort of uh, to the priests as well. And then here he begins right now, I mean, he's going to take the priests to task. Um, I think Wilford mentioned this last week. Um, one of the first things I thought of when I was studying this was the fact that 1 Peter 2.9 says we're what? Priests, right? I didn't mean we're offering sacrifices like those priests did, but we're a royal priesthood just like in the same manner of, uh, or in the same way that these priests were. Um, two verses, in verses Two, he's sort of got a threat. That's the way I read it, as a threat to the priests. And uh, he talks about uh, he talks about a curse. Uh, I guess that's later on. No, that's in uh, verse two there. And I'll curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them. Why the priest in particular? Yeah, 
and that's, he gets into that a little bit later in the in the later verses when he starts talking about Levi. Um, it's interesting. You ever you ever, uh, and I know God doesn't do this, but as I read what he's saying about Levi. That's not the Levi that I read about in the in the Old Testament, right? You know how sometimes you 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 know somebody and then you you you're separated from them for a long time, and uh, and you get to thinking about them, and sometimes the way you remember them is not really how they are. I know, I know that's not how God does it, but that's the first thing I thought of when I was reading. I was like, that's not the Levi that I knew. You know, I. And, and then that led me down another pig trail. We may get into some of it tonight. I don't know. But uh, yeah, he's telling them. Uh, he's telling them that he is uh, displeased, and he's saying. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to curse I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings he'd already done this somebody go over to uh, Haggai chapter 1 Haggai chapter 1 and this is not the only time he's ever done it Haggai chapter 1 and read verses uh, 6 through 11 got a volunteer for that Listen to what is read here and think about it in, in, in the mindset of what we know about Israel at this time and what Malachi is preaching about. Haggai chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. You got it, Kenny? Go ahead. Does it sound like he's pleased with them? You know, sometimes uh, I, I get in, I sort of try to think back and I think about how people saw these things and and I, I hear some of it today. You know, you got some people look at this last cold snap we just had and like, oh, it's global warming, we're all going to die. Then you got other people that are like, oh, there's no such thing as global warming. We, uh, we, when you're talking about weather, you know, I think people saw what was going on and they thought, well, it's just a dry year. Or, uh, you know, I know things haven't been worked out lately. They didn't want to, it's, it's almost easier just to kind of blame it off on that than to admit what the problem was. And the problem that he had in Haggai and, and basically the same thing you're seeing in Malachi is, is they didn't have their priorities right. Haggai, he... He says, you've got your own houses to sleep in. You didn't build mine, and they were supposed to, right? Um, they were worried about themselves, their physical needs instead of their spiritual needs, and that's the same thing that I see here in Malachi. It's one of the reasons why uh, God is, is so cross with the, with the priests. Um, the other thing is he's trying to get their attention, and, um, and they're hard-headed. I mean, they are hard-headed, and uh, I look. I saw this um, in Ezekiel chapter three. Uh, God sends Ezekiel to the house of Israel. And tells them they're really hard-headed, uh, and some people I've seen it. I can't remember which one it was, but one of them I laughed. I laughed out loud because it says they had a forehead like a diamond. I mean, that's how hard. That's how hard-headed they were. If you read Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 7 and 9, it says, But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, 
for they are not willing to listen to me because all the house of Israel have a, have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Behold, I have made, my, I have made your face their faces and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery harder than flint have I made your forehead. Fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. How would you like for God to describe you as, as having a forehead like a diamond? Can we be that way sometimes? I can't. I, I guess, you know, probably the rest of you don't, but I could be hard-headed. Um, he's trying to get their attention, and they're not having it. And so he's going to continue to get their attention. Uh, look in verses 3 and 4. It says, uh, Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, uh, that my covenant with Levi may, may stand, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, everybody knows what dung is, right? Do we have to go over this? If you've got a small child at home, you know what you know what I'm talking about. Um, it also can mean um, the awful that's left over from the sacrifices that they made. So, in one sense. I think you can take it both ways. In one sense, it's kind of like dung. Sure enough, dung that we would think of, you know, cow dung or whatever it is. In another way, it's, a, it's maybe maybe lost on them. I don't know, but um, in in uh, the Levitical law, when they sacrificed a bull or a, a goat, they had uh, rules about what they were supposed to do with the hide and the, uh, some of the guts and the bones and all that stuff. They had to take it outside. They had to carry it outside the camp and actually burn it as, a, as another kind of, some kind of offering. Of, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember thinking that that sort of corresponds to, does anybody have something that says, uh, and, shall, and shall be taken away with it? Does anybody have anything besides that there in verse uh, 3? Spread dung on your, huh? I'm gonna, I will spread on your faces the awful from your festival sacrifices, and I will, and you will be carried off with it. Yeah, just, and I think they would understand that. They would understand. Um, refuse, yeah. Um, while I was kind of studying this out, I saw a video on Facebook of a guy that had taken his son hunting. And he was probably about 16 or 17, and he killed his first buck. And his dad was going to make him uh, field dress it. And that poor kid must, I don't know if he just had a weak stomach or what it was, but every single time that he would go to stick his hand up in there to get it out, he would start to retch. And I mean, he would just bleh, bleh, again and again until he finally stood up. And, and they were just laughing. Them guys, them old guys were laughing at him, you know. And I remember thinking, that's kind of what it would be like. That's what he's saying. He's saying, all that stuff that you that's gross and nasty, I'm going to throw this right in the middle of you. What would that do to a priest that had contact with that? Yeah, that was a big deal, right? Um, what could happen if you tried to offer a sacrifice to God and you were unclean? Do you remember? Well, that's, that would be probably the best thing that could happen to you is you just wasted your time. Sometimes, if you were unclean, you, you didn't... Uh, uh, if the priest didn't cleanse himself the way he was supposed to and, and consecrate himself and he went in to offer a sacrifice, God would break out against him and kill him. Dead. I mean, uh, I, I can't remember if I read that uh, in an article somewhere, but I, I can remember somebody in a class talking about that the uh, high priest, they would tie a rope around his leg when he went in to, to, to give the uh, uh, sacrifice for the uh, sins of the children of Israel, the, the yearly, the, uh, I can't remember the name, the, the high, what am I talking about here? Uh, the one they did once a year, the Day of Atonement. I know. 
They would tie a rope around his leg because if he didn't consecrate himself right, he could drop over dead in there and nobody would know because he was the only one that went in. Okay? And he's going to start talking about some of the things um, um, about the priests that I find interesting. Why was Levi, the tribe of Levi, why were they priests? This is what started the pig trail that I, that I started studying. Why were they priests? Yeah. Kind of. Um, if, you, if you remember, um, Levi had a sister named Dinah, and she was raped by this guy named Shechem. And... Um, and I promise you we're going somewhere with this, but they, 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 she was raped by Shechem, and Shechem decided he loved her, and he wanted to marry her. But he wasn't, you know, they weren't allowed to intermarry and all that stuff, or they didn't, or her brothers didn't want him. They wanted him to, to be punished for it. So Simeon and Levi, they lied to him. They said, all right, here's what we'll do. If you want to marry her, every man in this whole city, you, he was a prince, Shechem was a prince, every man in this city, uh, you got to be circumcised, just like we're circumcised. And Shechem's like, okay, we'll do it. And then it says uh, about three days later when they were all pretty well hobbled up and couldn't move very good, Simeon and Levi went in there and killed every single person in the, in the city. Now, like Adam said, they ended up, they, they didn't get an inheritance like uh, the other ones did. And part of that has to do with, uh, if you look at uh, Genesis 49, when Jacob starts, when Jacob starts uh, blessing all his sons, when you get to uh, Genesis 49, somebody read verses 5, 6, and 7 there. You got it, Andrew? Here's what I want to maybe offer to you, and we're going to see it a little bit later on. One of the reasons, I think Levi, I think, uh, was Levi right to want to see punishment brought on the man that raped his sister? That's, that's totally reasonable, right? He killed a whole bunch of people that didn't have anything to do with it, too. What I'm going to put forth to you is, and we'll see this again later on with some other men, Levi was a passionate man. hot and make him do things like his anger was was bad. Uh, Jacob cursed his anger. He still had strong feelings about things, right? I think that's part of the key. Um, part of the reason why Levi, maybe amongst all of his brothers, might have been a more passionate man than the rest of them. I'm not sure. But I'll give you another example of this here in just a little bit. Uh, let's look at Uh, well, okay, um, Exodus 32, you can go to Exodus 32, and I won't read it because we'll, well, yeah, we got a ways to go. Exodus 32, if you read uh, verses 25 through 29, what has happened is um, Moses has, has went up to the mountain to receive the law, and He'd be gone for 40 days. And there's some, there's some issue in the language. I haven't studied it completely, but it's like he had been gone 40 days, but uh, maybe according to the Jewish calendar, it wasn't 40 full days. I, I don't know, but he, he was late coming back. And you guys know what happened. They all said, oh, we've got to have a God that we can see, that we can worship the one that brought us out, so make us a calf. And Aaron uh, does it. 
and kind of makes it sound like, well, I just threw the gold in. I just took it and threw it in the furnace, and it came out a calf. But actually, he fashioned it into a calf for him. But if you get to verse 25, Moses, you know, he knows what happens. He comes back down, and he says, uh, tells the people there, he sees what's happened, and, and he says, if you're with God, I'm paraphrasing here, if you're with God, come over here to me now. And who comes? The whole tribe of Levi, right? They come there together, and what do they do? He says, if you continue reading there, because he was mad, he was, he was angry with Aaron because it says he allowed the people to uh, be unrestrained. They were worshiping this God. They, were, they, they fashioned this God, this golden calf, and they were like, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Um, Moses says, go in there and kill everybody that's doing this. And the tribe of Levi goes in, and they kill their own brothers and sisters for worshiping a false god. And it says, consecrate, uh, there at the end I think he says, consecrate yourself to the Lord. Now, we'll see some other things that happen later on, but again, I want you to see that for whatever reason, the people of Levi were pretty passionate about what they did. When they saw something that was wrong, now not all of them, because Aaron was a, of the tribe of Levi too, wasn't he? So he's not perfect. But I, I see this again and again and again. And then, um, if you look at, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss another one down here later on. Let's go on to, uh, let's look at verses 5. So that sets it up. Let's look at verses 5 through 9. And what I want to give to you here is, is, is the ideal is contrasted against the real in these, in these four verses. Verses 5 through 7, it says, My covenant, he's talking about Levi, it says, My covenant with, with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from me. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. That's what he's saying is what should, that's how it should be. And, and in some respects, Levi was that way. And I say Levi, he was never a priest. It was actually his descendants, okay? Um, he's saying these, they feared him. They stood in awe of him. Uh, they taught truth. No wrong was found on his lips. He walked with God in peace and uprightness and turned many away from iniquity or sin. He guarded knowledge and was the type of person that people sought out instruction from. I would ask this. Can you describe, can you look at that and say, I'm, I'm kind of that kind of person? Because if we're priests, and we are, does God expect us to be this type of person today? Yeah. It should be a goal at least, right? Um, verses 8 through 9 are going to describe how it actually is. Uh, and he says, uh, But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways but show partiality in your instruction. Kind of keep your finger on that last part. We'll come back to it. Um, there was a guy of the tribe of Levi that distinguished himself from the rest of them in his passion. And it was said that God made a covenant with him that his, his uh, family would be, his descendants would be uh, priests. Do you remember who he was? Look at uh, Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. Uh, 
Uh, somebody read verses 10 through 13 for me there. Get it right. When you got it, go ahead. 10 through 13. Yep. And the Lord said to Moses, Phineas the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. So here's what happened. If you go back and read the preceding verses, um, God had sent a plague amongst the people because they had been marrying wives that were not, uh, they were forbidden to do this. This ties in later on, I think you can see. They've been marrying uh, foreign women, and those women were were influencing their husbands and their and their children to go off into idolatry. So he sends a plague on them. And twenty, uh, I had it written down here. Twenty four thousand uh, had died, and uh, this guy, um, he's from. The tribe of Simeon, his name's Zimri. He takes a Midianite wife, and he kind of does it in defiance of Moses. Just like I'm, this is my wife. I don't care what you guys think. I don't care what. Just totally oblivious to the fact that twenty-four thousand people had died. Phineas, who is the grandson of Aaron, says he was eaten up with zeal for God. He he basically takes a javelin and kills both of them. And. Uh, the Lord stops the plague uh, that had killed 24,000 people. And then he makes that covenant with, with Phineas and his descendants. Again, murder's not, murder's not uh, right. But in this instance, this, this was more like judgment. God had said, you know, he was, he'd killed 24,000 people already. And he made this uh, judgment on Zimri and his wife. Phineas killed both of them. I think the key that I see here, and and I'm if you want to if you want to think of it too, um, Levi, Phineas, David was this. David's not of the tribe of Levi, but it, uh, David was a man after God's own heart. What's one of David's um, defining characteristics? He was a passionate man. When I couple that with with what I see, uh, like what uh, the book of Revelation says about the church at Laodicea, isn't that the one that he said, uh, I'd rather you be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm on us, I'll spit you out. I bring all this up because he's, he's saying Levi is the guy. I really want you to be like Levi. Maybe not to be as angry as Levi was, but to have that kind of passion for God. That's what he wants from us, I think. That's what he wanted from from Israel, and they're just sort of mailing it in. I mean, they're just not they're just not. I mean, they're offering bum lambs, you know, blind lambs and lame lambs, and they knew that they were supposed to offer the perfect ones, right? Um, if you look at um, the one, I always go back to. It's it's first. We won't read it. First Samuel seventeen. Verse 26, when David, I say he's a man of passion, when David comes on to the scene and, and, and Goliath is out here cursing everybody and daring them to come out and fight him, and David's like, why has somebody not went and killed this man? You know, he, he can't understand it because he's defying the living God of heaven, right? He, and, and he, out of all the people, nobody wanted to go fight Goliath, right? David was a man after, his own, after God's own heart, at least in part because of his passion that he had. He had passion and zeal for, for God. That's what he's looking for from his, from his, uh, from his uh, priests here. And they're, not, and, he's, and they're not giving it to him. Anybody have any questions about that? 
Let's look at verse 10. And this kind of changes subjects here. It's still against the priests. Uh, but it says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Um, it seems like people, and he's going he's gonna to define this a little better later on, people were dealing treacherously with each other. They were faithless. Uh, they, they didn't keep their word. Um, they um, they profane the covenant. It says, um, verse eleven: Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. Some might have... Uh... Michelle, you, used to, you, you have King James, don't you? You didn't bring... Okay. Somebody else have a King James version? You could read that verse for us. You got it? Try that and see what it says. 11. Do you see the difference there? Uh, my ESV says, For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. And you're said profane the Lord's holy institution. What's he talking about here? If you read the rest of it, he's talking about marriage. Um, New King James, I guess, uh, I think maybe the King James did too. They, when that word institution in your Bible, is it in italics? Yes. Okay. So when you see that, what that means is, is that word didn't appear in the um, original uh, language. It means that the translators inserted that there to help make, the to, to finish out the idea. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes Greek, uh, is really succinct in what it says and is really good, but every once in a while it doesn't translate over to English very well at all. So they put this word institution in there. ESP doesn't have it because it doesn't, it doesn't show it. Um, it's, it's not there. But in light of the rest of the passages that he's going to talk about, um, you're going to see that fits perfectly. He's talking about marriage here. They have defiled the institution of marriage. Um, part of uh, Exodus 34, 16 uh, says that part of the covenant law they had, they weren't to take foreign wives. Now, I don't know the answer to this. I'm going to ask a question. And some of you are smarter than me and you know. Was it ever okay for them to take a foreign wife if that foreign wife converted, became a proselyte? Does anybody know that? I don't know the answer. Uh, he he married a. It's inferred that Ruth was converted to a proselyte. Okay. Doesn't say. You have to be careful because if you can find an example of something happening, it doesn't mean God approved of it, right? Just because you see something, you know, there's, there's people that say, well, uh, if you go back to, uh, if you go back to Jacob, he had more than one wife. That did happen. Was that how God designed marriage to be? <coughs> Jesus said it wasn't. So, I'm not sure what the answer is. This is one that I'll have to probably go study myself later on. Uh, Uh, Rahab and uh, Ruth. Well, oh, that's what that's kind of what Michelle was saying. That it's insinuated that they. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, that's fine, man. Actually, if you reverse it, 
the condemnation comes to marrying Anju, who did not worship God, but worshiped foreign gods. Mm -hmm. So if they were a non-Jew and worshiped God, I don't know if they were considered a foreign wife or not. Yeah. I bet they knew. I bet it was not. I bet. I bet they knew. And that's kind of where I'll go with this. Is is I, I don't know what the answer is. It seems to me that if I found a woman that I loved and she was worshiping some false god, and I convinced her that the god of heaven was the god of the universe, and she she believed that and and decided she was going to follow, kind of like Ruth did, uh, your people will be my people, and and uh, your gods will be my god. That sounds like conversion, doesn't it? I would think that would be okay, but you're still kind of going against what God told you to do. And so they had done this a lot. Um, I do not know at this particular time, one thing that I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of evidence for it, uh, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but do, do you guys know, does anybody know, were there still plural wives happening here? You say probably, but you don't know. So I don't get that. I get that's why they're because because um, if you if you go on down here, um, it's going to talk about how they were divorcing the wife of their youth. And if they could just have more than one wife, why not just marry? Three or four other ones, you know, and have your main one. Do you not think it's talking about them leaving them? Huh? It's not talking about their actual literal marriage. It's talking about the Israelites leaving God and going after one God. I think that's in there, but I think, but I think this. I, I think you you have to be careful to say it doesn't mean that they weren't intermarrying because they were talking about the God of your your youth and how uh, he says later on. Um, Okay, that's a good point. I'm going to say this. Um, if you go on down to verse uh, 12, it says, May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this and brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. That's another one where your spy says something different. New King James? It doesn't? Maybe there's a King James. One of them talks about uh, being awake and aware. In other words, it's it's uh, it's uh, you know it's sin and you don't care. It's it's uh, there's a there's a an attitude that I'm thinking of and I, I can't put my finger on it. Uh, uh, not apathy. It's it's more defiant. It's it's not defiant, but it's something else. I'll think of it tonight about midnight and. I'll text everybody then. Uh, no, it's like, uh, like I said, it's like you understand that it's a sin and you don't care. Um, awake and aware. And and that's what he's going to get into in verse 13. In this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's tears with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering accepts it with favor from your hand but you say why is he not because the Lord because and this is the Lord remember we talked about how this whole book the way it's laid out it's didactic where God will make a statement and then he will um, he'll put their uh, he will word their response and then he'll respond to it. that's what he's doing right um you cover the Lord's altar with tears, uh, but you say, "Why does He not?" He says, "He says uh, He no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand." But you say, "Why does He not?" And the Lord says, "Because, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your and your wife by covenant. Did He not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union?" That's why I think it's specifically talking about marriage. It's also a metaphor for, 
I, it's, it's also a metaphor for um, um, their covenant relationship with God. And you can see that in some of the other Old Testament books, uh, like Hosea is one of them, huh? Yes. You're saying he's often compared it? He has. Yes. Yep. I'm going to say we got to verse 12 or so, maybe. We may want to come back to that. Thank you for your time.